Jesus went to the district of Tyre. He entered a house and wanted no one to know about it, but he could not escape notice. Soon a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. She came and fell at his table. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to drive the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied and said to him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's scraps. Then he said to her, For saying this, you may go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When the woman went home, she found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord worked many miracles, and these are not inventions or mere symbols. They were real events that happened. Among other things, there will be a kind of certificate of authenticity, that is to say that Jesus Christ was really supported by God in his teachings, especially in his claim to be God, in his claim to divinity. But each of the miracles, besides benefiting a specific person, in some way benefits us all because it is a teaching. Each miracle is a fact and also a symbol. That is, it has a message. In this case, the Lord is far from his usual territory, Galilee, Samaria, Judea. He is far away. He is in the north. It is a hard road to travel. He is in the city of Tyre, in the region of Tyre, one of the great cities of ancient Syria, today Lebanon. So he is in a pagan world. He has gone to see what a pagan world is like, different from the Jewish world in which he was born and lived. He meets a woman who has a sick daughter. The man gives her an answer, of course knowing the outcome. One can understand the answer he gives to this woman, but he gives an answer that is somehow offensive or provocative because he compares her to a dog. The dog was an animal not as forbidden or as cursed as the pig, but it was an animal that was not well regarded among the Jews. He said, It is not right to feed, to make food for children and be given to the dogs. It is not right to do this miracle to a non-Jew because it is not right to feed the dogs. And this woman turns the image around and says, Yes, but also the dogs, the little dogs, eat the crumbs that fall from the table of the masters. Have mercy on me. And the Lord, who knew what was going to happen, of course, does the miracle that this woman has asked for. What is the teaching? The teaching is humility. What wouldn't a mother do to save her son or her daughter? What wouldn't she do? In this case, this woman could have reacted to these words of the Lord, which could really be understood as an offense. We would certainly have to see the tone of voice in which she said it. But let the children be satisfied first. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. The tone of voice could be a tone that would indicate that it was not a desire to offend. It could literally be shown. It could be understood as an offense. You are treating me like a dog. You who are a foreigner. You who come to my house, to my country, to my city and treat me like a dog. The woman could have been very angry. She could have even shouted at him. She could have raised a row against him. She could have raised her neighbors against him. Look at this foreigner who comes here and says that I am a dog, who treats us like dogs. This woman responded to this provocation. I am convinced that the Lord knew what was going to happen and was putting her to the test. 
He is putting you to the test. She responded with humility. This humility made the Lord perform the miracle for her daughter, who was otherwise a girl possessed by the devil. That is to say, pride. Pride is overcome with humility, and humility always opens the doors to the heart of Jesus, to the heart of God. Humility. Now, when a person is humble, when he prays, what do we have to do? We pray with humility. Because it could be, and in fact, I think it is quite frequent that the form is humble. When is the form of prayer humble? When we ask. When we ask. When the form of prayer is proud. When we demand. If a person says to God, I demand that you give me this. He is not asking, he is demanding. He is being proud before God. But this is very rare. I do not know if it ever existed. Instead, we can be using a humble form of prayer with a background of pride, which of course does not deceive God. We may say, Lord, I ask you. And actually, in our hearts and mind, we are saying, Lord, I demand you. We are even saying, I command you. I command you. I demand you. As if the Lord is not the Lord. But as if the Lord is an employee, someone you have in your house and you say, Hey, you are in my service. I am paying you this money. I command you to do this. I command you to do that. Or I demand you to do this. We have transformed the Lord from the role of God, our Lord, to the role of a servant. Sometimes even a slave because you have to pay your employees and you do not pay God anything. Pride closes God's heart. Humility opens it. Now, how can I know if beyond the formula that I repeat? Generally, the correct formula is used. Lord, I ask you. I beg of you. How can I know if she is really being humble when she asks? What does Jesus do with this woman? Jesus tests her. He tests this woman. He tests her with a provocative response. He is testing her. That is what the Lord does with us. Many times he puts us to the test. We ask and we do not realize that perhaps we are demanding. It is not our intention to demand, to command, to order God as if he were an employee or a slave. But deep down we are doing it. How do we know if we are asking with humility or if we are demanding with pride? And also when we complain that we are not giving what we have asked for, it is not because we have not asked with humility but because we have demanded with pride. And how do we know? Precisely by our response. The woman's response was humility. With our response when God gives us what we ask for, that is the key. What is your answer? I know many people, many, many, many people who have turned away from God because God did not grant them what they were asking for. Those people possibly, I am almost certain, never asked for anything. The formula was right. They even insisted. And what they were asking for was good for them, for a relative. Everything was right. But they were never asking, they were demanding, they were claiming, they were treating God as their employee. Behind the word, I ask you, deep down they were saying, I demand you. And that is why when they do not give you, you get angry. If you are asking and do not give you, you have no reason to get angry because you are not claiming a right. You are asking for a favor. If I ask a friend, even a close friend, please, I have this need, can you help me? And my friend says, I am sorry, but I can't. Maybe he will accompany me and he will be asking for me. Look, I really can't. I am already busy that day. I am committed. And I get angry. It will be proof that I have not been asking my friend for a favor. But I have been treating him as if he were my employee. 
and I have been demanding that he do what I am formally asking him. But in reality, I have been claiming and demanding. How do I react when God doesn't give me what I ask for? That reaction is what shows if you are proud or humble, if you have asked with pride, if you have demanded, or if you have asked with humility. The person who is humble always opens the doors of God's heart. You have to ask insistently. You have to ask. You do not have to demand. And when you ask and ask with humility and they give it to you, you go crazy with gratitude. But when you demand and they do not give it to you, you get angry. You walk away. You see you have a crisis of faith. A false crisis of faith because you never really had faith. You never really believed that God was God. You thought God was your employee. That is not true faith. Although that is not faith at all. But then when you have demanded and they give it to you, you do not thank them because you have the impression that they haven't done you any favor. They have simply given you what you were entitled to receive. When we pray, let us always say to the Lord, when we finish asking, let us always say to the Lord, Lord, if you do not give me what I am asking for, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. I am asking for it, but if you do not give it to me, I will not understand. I will surely suffer because I am asking for it, and I need it for myself and for this person. But nothing will happen, Lord. I will not leave your side because I know that you are God and I trust in you and I believe in your love. If you give it to me, I will thank you enormously and more reason to thank you for all that you have already given me. But if you do not give it to me, nothing will happen. I will not leave your side, Lord. I will always be with you because I am not with you to be given to you. I am with you because of what you have already given me especially because you have opened for me with your redeeming blood the gates of heaven. Amen.